Right, well here we are at Exeter College, and this is the college that Morris and Burne Jones came up to in 1853. Ah. So what was Oxford like in 1853? Well, colleges were in some senses rather like monasteries because they were all male, of course. Now it's 50% female. <laughs> and um, fellows were not allowed to marry, had to live in college. Oh, and so of course the design of a college is rather like a monastery, with quadrangles and with a chapel and a hall. It is. It must have inspired a lot of medieval dreams in young Morris and Burne Jones. Absolutely, yes. Oxford was much more like a medieval city. And Burne Jones wrote about coming back from Godstow Nunnery and seeing visions of knights and ladies riding along the river. And you can still do that. You can still go across Port Meadow and visit Godstow. And see knights and ladies? No. <laughs> Only in your imagination. Exactly. You have to imagine them. Burne Jones did. Well, here we are in the chapel. I love this chapel. It's beautiful. It's Gothic Revival, so it was built in the 1850s. It was actually being built while Morris and Burne Jones were students in Oxford. So the college must have been a bit like a building site while they were here. <laughs> but it was built in imitation of the Saint Chapelle in Paris. Oh, right. So it has all this lovely stained glass. It is gorgeous, and it gives such a beautiful light. I'm sure it was really inspiring. I mean, not just this chapel which was being built, but all the other medieval chapels in Oxford, all the things yes, that they saw. That's right. So there was a lot of genuine Gothic architecture, and then there was new Gothic architecture being put up at the same time as well. <laughs> in this chapel, of course, there's the wonderful tapestry of the Adoration of the Magi, or the Star of Bethlehem, which they made for the chapel in 1886, or at least it was made by Morris's firm. And yeah. um, one of the things they really liked about the Middle Ages was that there was no hard and fast distinction between the fine and decorative arts. And um, so the idea of Morris's firm was that they would make a whole range of things to beautify people's lives. Okay. So not just paintings or sculpture? In fact, they didn't make paintings or sculpture in the firm. Um, okay. Um, but they made wall hangings, um, tiles, stained glass, wallpaper, Furniture, even. Carpet? Carpets. Carpet, everything. Yes. So you could, eventually, you could have a complete Morris interior. So how did Morris get interested in tapestry? Well, apparently, it was um, a childhood memory of being in this hunting lodge, Queen Elizabeth's hunting lodge in Epping Forest, uh -huh. and seeing this faded greenery all around the walls. Uh -huh. So again, it was this idea of the romance of the Middle Ages, and tapestries being the usual wall decoration for castles and places like that. But it wasn't until 1879 that he started actually making tapestries, and it was very typical of Morris that he wanted to find out exactly how it was done by doing it himself. So he made this tapestry, which he called Cabbage and Vine, and he recorded in his diary how much time he spent at the loom each day, and, and then he much? totaled it all up, and he might spend three hours or nine hours a day, and at the end, he worked out he'd spent 516 and a half hours making this tapestry. And a half. Yes. Right. So he was someone who really believed that working with your hands was, was one of the most satisfying things you could do in life. But this tapestry, the Star of Bethlehem, took um, two years to make um, and three weavers were engaged on it. Wow. So it was very labour intensive. But the result is something that is made by hand. So there's the, the love that's gone into it. But also when you look at something that's handmade, Morris and Burne Jones believed you get so much more out of looking at it and living at, with it than you do with, you know, from living with things that are just made by machine. But wasn't it an irony of Morris and Company that his designs became so popular that manufacturers started to replicate his oh, designs? Oh yes, yes, yes. And you can you can now buy Morris tapestries on the over the internet. Yes, but it's not and the Morris same. And Morris wallpaper. And of, Morris, Morris wallpaper, of course. Yes, things, yes, yes. You can buy them all. And another problem was that he wanted to improve the lives of ordinary people, and he became mm. a committed socialist later in life, of course. Yes. But what he made was expensive. But, um, so I, rich people bought it? Yes, he said he didn't like ministering to the swinish luxury of the rich. I'm sure that made him a great salesman. Yes. <laughs> anyway, they were delighted, I think, when they were asked to produce this tapestry for their own college. Yeah. And then they also had this idea of cooperation between artists. So. This wasn't made by one person, it wasn't even designed by one person. Burne Jones designed the figures, Morris then did the overall design, and then the flowers were designed by a man called John Henry Dill, who was, who'd started as an apprentice 
in Morris's workshops. Oh, right. And, um, and I think you can see in it, you can see their love for the Middle Ages, certainly. You definitely can. Well, I mean, the three kings are medieval knights and medieval sages, and yeah, it's, it's all kind of a representation of upper-class medieval society coming to pay homage to uh, the infant Christ. Yes, Amazing. yes. And, and the angel is like the sculptures they'd seen on cathedrals in northern France, such as Chartres. And then I think there's also a kind of echo of paintings like Botticelli's Primavera, mm. which Ben Jones would have seen in Florence, the way you've got these large figures against a mainly flat background. Although, when you look closely at it, and you can see the wood stretching into the distance behind the figures, there is quite a lot of depth in it. You often get that with Victorian medievalism, don't you? They, you, they want the flatness of the Middle Ages, but they, they know that you need some perspective in there. So you can, as you look at it, they, they do have all the, the forming and the figures of a, a classical, um, classical drawing. Yes, yes, that's right. And then the subject was actually suggested by the rector of the college. Uh -huh. But you can see how it would have appealed to both of them, really. I mean, Ben Jones, for his knowledge of Renaissance art, something that had been painted over and over again. Mm -hmm. And then Morris, the socialist, because it's, a, it's about a poor family. And when you look at the left-hand side of the tapestry, especially the figure of Joseph, mm -hmm. he's got a halo, OK, but he just looks like a beggar, doesn't he, with his he does. um, bundle of twigs. And there are these noble, rich kings coming to pay homage to this very poor family. And Mary is just in a sort of rustic shelter, sitting on a sheaf of corn. And that must have appealed to them when they were both going to enter the church here in Exeter, was it? <laughs> yes, yes. And of course, yeah. once they were here, um, at one point they, they t thought of founding a monastery themselves. Yes. But then they decided to devote their lives to art instead. And Morris seems to have become a free thinker. And in his socialist paradise, which he describes in News From Nowhere, mm, yeah. Christianity has made way for a religion of humanity. But Burne Jones, well, we really don't know. Um, he was asked by a small child whether he believed in this, and he said, it's too beautiful not to be true.